This is the story of a killer, a man so elusive he slipped from the law's grasp half a dozen times, allowing him to kill across three different countries. A story of luck, timing, even fate. It's also the story of a global crime-fighting organization called Interpol. Jurisdiction, the world. When crimes are committed, an international organization unites police officers to deliver justice. Interpol investigates. The story that will span 28 years begins in the lazy resort town of Pattaya, Thailand, in the mid-1970s. One morning, a fisherman in a longboat finds the body of a woman floating in the water. When the Royal Thai police are alerted, they rush to the scene. The coroner examines the victim and questions the fisherman. There isn't much to go on. They find no identification and there are no signs of foul play. The conclusion the woman is most likely a young Westerner whose vacation has come to an abrupt end. Probably the result of a swimming accident. At the morgue, the coroner fingerprints and examines the victim. Her identity is listed as unknown. A toxicology test reveals alcohol and hashish in her system. The medical examiner has seen enough cases like this in her career. An unsuspecting tourist deciding to take a night swim and falling prey to the waters off of Pattaya. The police go about the routine business of uncovering the woman's identity. They canvass the area hotels, looking to see if anyone has reported a foreigner missing. They find nothing. All the while they wait for reports of missing persons to come across their desks. Reports that might match the description of the young drowning victim. But two months later, another discovery grabs the attention of the Royal Thai Police. A worker driving his truck on a road near the very same beach notices something unusual in the brush. It is the body of a second young Westerner. Police comb the area, but find few clues. She is a young woman, perhaps a student on an overseas vacation. But there is no identification. No purse, no wallet, no passport. In the beginning, there was no alarm raised over this. Covering the two deaths, reporter Alan Dawson People didn't really correlate for a while the appearance of, of one body and then another. But one person who is paying attention is Sompol Suthamai, a lieutenant colonel in the Thai police department, who is also the head of Interpol in Thailand. 
It isn't the similarities of the cases that catch his eye. It is the differences. They were both found near the seaside, but the conditions of the bodies were different. The police report stated that the second woman was deliberately drowned. This discovery casts a long shadow over the first victim, the one the fisherman found. Perhaps she had been deliberately drowned as well. John Imhoff, former director of Interpol's U.S. office. The Thai officials have a problem on their hands. They have dead bodies. They have no identification associated with them. They know they have an investigation that they have to pursue criminally. But one of the key steps to getting that started is the identification of the victim. Pictures of the victims from the morgue are released to the Bangkok Post. Tens of thousands in Southeast Asia start their day by reading this English language newspaper. Police hope that one of these readers could provide a lead. But days later, the two women in the Pattaya morgue remain unidentified. Pattaya, Thailand is not the place you'd expect a killing spree. Known as the Riviera of Thailand, Pattaya caters to Westerners. Young men and women looking for a good time in an exotic land. Young people were attracted to Thailand. They thought that it had so much to offer compared with their culture and they would soak it all up. Pattaya is the unofficial starting point of a popular route traveled by young tourists that leads through Thailand, India and Nepal. Travelers come for a taste of Eastern philosophy and the ready supply of hashish and alcohol. The relaxed atmosphere gives them a false sense of security. And this would make them especially vulnerable to the predators who were on the trail. Less than a month after the discovery of the two women's bodies in Pattaya, villagers find two more bodies. This time, it is a man and a woman. They are clearly young and again Western. They were undoubtedly murdered. The bodies were still burning when they were discovered. This was a horrific crime. Both of the victims' faces are scorched. Police look for anything, some sort of identification, some kind of lead. All they can find, a tag on the woman's clothing that reads, made in Holland. The police still have no leads and no motive. Using forensic evidence, they reconstruct the murders. The woman was beaten with a hard object. The man was whipped, strangled, until he couldn't breathe. The coroner also finds soot in both of the victim's air passages. An indication that the couple were still alive when they were set on fire. This is a most inhuman act. The person who did this has an evil heart. The Thai police search everywhere for suspects and leads. But their efforts turn up nothing. Three women and one man, all between 18 and 25 years of age, are dead. Police hope that information will fly along the tourist trail and hope that someone, somewhere, might have crossed paths with any of the young travelers and picked up information that might result in a lead. The news of the trouble in Thailand hasn't made it to the end of the trail, almost 1,400 miles away, in Kathmandu, Nepal. Both countries recently joined Interpol, but communication is rudimentary, and officials here don't know that a killer is on the move. 
until two bodies are discovered outside of Kathmandu. A pair of Nepalese boys stumble upon the grisly scene. It was a sight they'll never forget. Nor would the investigators. It was difficult to say who the victims were. The woman had a wound on her chest and the man had a wound on his neck. Kathmandu detective Bishwa Lal Shrestha investigates both murders. When we saw the dead bodies, the faces were burned. They were naked. We had no idea who could have done this. Securing the crime scene, the police turned the boys back. They don't want them to be confronted with such a gruesome image. But they have already seen too much. The Nepalese police suspect that the couple was traveling together. Adventurous Westerners soaking up the culture of Nepal. And in Kathmandu there is one place that any visitor is certain to go. Yonchan Tol, also known as Freak Street. Investigators begin their search there. In the hotels and hostels that cater to travelers. At one lodge, a clerk remembers that a pair of the guests had gone backpacking and had not returned for several days. Their names? Pierre Beaumont and Vanessa Wilson. When police search the room, most of the travellers' belongings are still there. But their passports are gone. We also found a diary. Written inside, we found the name Alain Gautier from Bangkok. Friends of the travellers hear the activity in the room next door. Yes, we do. Can you identify these two people? Concerned about the missing couple, they tell police everything they can about the pair. One remembers seeing Vanessa Wilson with a man who claimed to be a gem dealer from Bangkok. The police ask the traveler's friends to identify the bodies. Six bodies have now been found, but the two police departments still aren't in communication. It will be up to Interpol to stop this serial killer. In the Far East, six young Westerners have been found dead in similar circumstances. As the investigation continues in Thailand and Nepal, police don't realize they're chasing the same man, Charles Sabra, John Imhoff, former director of Interpol's U.S. office. Charles can present a persona that is what the people want to see, not what he really is. So if he wants to assume a false identity, he's practiced at this for a long time. The woman killed in Nepal had been seen with a gem dealer named Alain Gautier, an alias used by Charles Sabra. Throughout Kathmandu, officers search for leads. At one hotel, they find a clerk who remembers a guest matching the description. But he is not registered under the name Alain Gautier. Alan Gautier. He is registered as a Dutch national by the name of Carl Gassel. The clerk tells them that Gassel drove a white car. It isn't much of a lead, but it is something to go on. They search throughout Kathmandu, setting up checkpoints, stopping dozens of cars, and interviewing the occupants. 
an officer pulls over a vehicle that matches the description. The driver was calm. He produces passports, identifying himself as Carl Gassel. The woman, his wife, Ida Bosch. Police call off the search and escort the couple to headquarters for further questioning. The man claims to be a scholar. His wife, a Dutch television star. Do you recognize this young lady, sir? He insists he has never seen the murder victim before. When the witness is brought in to identify the man she met with Vanessa Wilson, she draws a blank. She can't positively identify him as the same man she saw with her friend. Kathmandu detective Bishwalal Shrestha. In Nepalese culture, any foreigner or guest is treated very nicely. So we didn't look at him suspiciously. False identification can be very difficult for the investigator. Documents can be reproduced and they can be made to look authentic. The police let the couple go. The man they know as Carl Gassel and his wife returned to their hotel. The investigators all the time are coming this close to capturing someone that needs to be brought to justice only to see them slip away because of their identification changed or because they were just a minute too late. Um, so that's, that's a huge frustration. Days later, a Kathmandu policeman takes a statement from a witness who saw a white car near where the bodies were found. Amazingly, she remembers the license plate number. It matches the plate on Carl Gassel's car. And then, hard evidence. Police find two arrival cards for the victim, Pierre Beaumont, and the signatures don't match. A handwriting expert finds that the signature on the second card has very similar characteristics to Carl Gassel's. And that second arrival card from the airport was dated December the 24th, the same day Pierre Beaumont's corpse was brought into the coroner's office. The police conclude that the man they know as Gassel had left the country and re-entered Nepal using the dead man's passport. The cool, calm professor was lying. Police now have a case against Gassel and hurry to make the arrest. But it is too late. Gassel and Ida Bosch are gone. There were clothes all over the place. Documents were all over the place. Some passports and gasoline. We also saw things to amend the passports. After we saw that, we knew for sure that this criminal had slipped away. Police have no idea where to find him. And it will be months before that information reaches Interpol. Reporter Alan Dawson. You could wait two days to get a call through to Nepal. And, and communications were not like they are today at all. By the time authorities could really make their case, uh, it was quite some time down the road and he was long gone. In Thailand, there are still no suspects and no identities of the four dead Western tourists. Interpol chief Sompol Suthamai searches for leads. It was certainly strange that a large number of foreigners were murdered. Nothing like this had happened before. We know that foreigners come to Thailand to relax. They don't come here to do any wrong or break our laws. So we were investigating the possibility that the perpetrator was from Thailand. While Thai police attempt to identify the victims, the Dutch embassy in Bangkok receives a vital clue. 
Herman Nippenberg is the most junior diplomat at the Dutch Embassy. He receives a letter in the diplomatic pouch about a missing Dutch couple who are travelling in Thailand. The family was very worried about the fact that for a period of over six weeks they had not had a sign of life from a couple who were ardent correspondents. 28-year-old Nippenberg can't imagine how important the couple's names would become. Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. The relative has only one lead. In the missing couple's last letter, they wrote that they had made a sophisticated new friend in Bangkok. The man was a gem dealer and he was helping Ida and Carl buy precious stones. The Frenchman had been very hospitable, had uh, taken them to dinner and had invited them to his apartment. They were not completely sure if this Frenchman was genuine in his intentions. They thought that there might be an ulterior motive from the Frenchman. But since that letter, nothing. The family asked the Dutch embassy for help finding them. They felt worried and I felt that they might have reason to be worried. Herman Nippenberg contacts Thai authorities and gives them the names Ida Bosch and Carl Gassel. But the Thai police have no information about the missing couple. Nippenberg has to find someone who knows this mysterious gem dealer. He gets a lead from a friend at another embassy. I learned from the Australian consul that an Australian couple, youngsters travelling, had been drugged and robbed by a French gems dealer. Nippenberg locates them from the Dutch embassy? and discovers the name of the gem dealer. Alan Gautier, but little else. In a city of four and a half million people, it will be next to impossible to locate Gautier. But then Nippenberg catches a break when he learns of a woman who knows Alain Gautier. Working after hours, he arranges an interview with the woman. She lives in the same apartment complex as Alain Gautier. Her name is Nadine Geyers. She tells an extraordinary story about a charming and ruthless killer. Several months earlier, Nadine met a French-Canadian woman named Marie Leclerc who moved into the building with her husband, Alain Gautier. Marie told Nadine that Gautier was extremely possessive and would probably kill her if she ever tried to leave. When Nadine expressed concern, Marie told her that she was joking. Nadine soon learned otherwise. My informants told me that Gautier was an extremely dangerous person. He was also charming and lured young foreigners into his apartment. Nippenberg learns about one guest who got sick, left with Gautier and never returned. People had a way of disappearing from the Alain Gautier apartment. They suddenly went on trips from which they never returned, leaving their jewellery and bags and passports behind. Nadine soon learns he had two willing accomplices. A.J. Chowdhury's reputation was most frightening. Chowdhury was uh, considered a killer who took great pride in showing people his knife. Marie Leclerc had more subtle skills. She had a great knowledge of pharmaceutical uh, things. She could inject people. She was considered the poisoner of the three. And then Nippenberg gets the information he was hoping for. Nadine had actually met the missing Dutch couple. 
Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. While they were buying gems from Alain, the couple fell ill. Not long after that, Gautier and A.J. Chowdhury whisked the sick Dutch couple away. Then one of Gautier's guests showed Nadine a picture from the Bangkok Post. They could see on the photograph in the newspaper that these people who had been murdered in such a cruel manner that they were wearing the clothes of the Dutch couple. Nadine now believed the horrifying photo of the burnt couple found outside Pattaya was Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. She had to find out what was going on. With Gautier and his two accomplices on a trip to Nepal, Nadine went into their apartment in a safe, journals, passports and jewellery. In a suitcase nearby, syringes, drugs, everything that the charming host, Alain Gautier, would need to kill his guests and assume their identity. Now afraid for her life, Nadine contacted a friend at an embassy who contacted Nippenberg. She took something from Gautier's apartment for proof. Ida Bosch's diary. She gives it to Nippenberg, along with press clippings about other murders and missing persons cases. Nippenberg reads the articles. And as he looks over the headline about the murder outside of Bangkok, a memory returns. The thing which stuck in my mind was that the female had worn a t-shirt with a label in it, made in Holland. Although not a police officer, Nippenberg finds himself in a position familiar to many investigators. Circumstantial evidence points him towards a solution. But he needs concrete proof. He gets that from the dental records of Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. I just entered the mark and suddenly from one of the corners of the room came this voice which said, Mr. Knippenberg, I found it. It's them. And at that moment I knew that our worst fears were becoming reality and that it was the young Dutch couple which had been murdered. Charles Sabraw is the suspected killer the Thai police are looking for. He had used the identity of Carl Gassel and the alias Alain Gautier to evade murder charges in Nepal. But law authorities in two countries have not made the connection. Interpol will have to put the pieces together and pick up the trail of the suspected killer. In Bangkok at the Dutch Embassy, diplomat Herman Nippenberg suspects gem dealer Alan Gautier of murdering a young Dutch couple. But he hasn't realized that the gem dealer is a suspected serial killer named Charles Sabraw. I had already very, very strong suspicions that more young people of roughly the same age and of a similar background had come to an end in a similar manner. Nippenberg compiles all the evidence he has secured into an exhaustive study of the killer's crimes in Thailand. Connecting the deaths of the two unidentified women with the Dutch couple. In his research, he comes across the unsolved murders in Kathmandu. I also saw press reports coming out of Nepal which described exactly the same operational method vicious killings followed by burnings with gasoline in Nepal. Nippenberg submits his report to the police and gets the response he's been waiting for. The Thai police in an undercover squad 
raid Alain Gautier's apartment. Inside, two men and a woman. The woman's name, Marie Leclerc. She has a valid passport. With her, AJ Chowdhury. Papers in order. Sabraw produces an American passport. Now he was calling himself Steve Watson. The police bring them to the station for further questioning. They also confiscate the safe that is in the apartment. But once again, the bust comes to nothing. Sabraw successfully convinces police that he really is an American. Several weeks. And his phony passport could not be verified on the spot. John Imhoff, former chief of Interpol's US office, explains why. Every document can be replicated. And if he is sufficiently skilled or he knows the right people who are sufficiently skilled to help him prepare an authentic looking US passport, yeah, there's no reason why the Thai officials would question that. The safe, which is supposed to be full of stolen passports, is empty, except for some receipts. The police hold the trio's passports, but let them go free. When the police stated to me there had been no proof of their criminal activities, I was of course quite flabbergasted. I could not stand idly by and have a group of completely innocent young people be uh, slaughtered without anybody lifting a finger. Nippenberg's file is also delivered to Interpol's National Central Bureau in Bangkok. Chief of Interpol, Sompol Suthamai, now has all the pieces of the puzzle. I understood from the beginning he had to commit more crimes, as he had a true criminal nature. He doesn't care anything about other people. He only looks after himself. No one knows the killer's real name. But Interpol is on his trail and his luck is about to run out. In Canada, agents track down the parents of Marie Leclerc. They learn that she had given her family a phone number in Paris of a woman by the name of Madame Sabraw. At Interpol headquarters in France, Agents run the name Sabraw through their international database of known felons. Finally, they discover the true identity of the suspected killer Charles Sabraw. He is already wanted in India. They put him on their most wanted list and issue a red notice to member countries around the world. You have an ability to very effectively disseminate to 181 countries instantaneously information about a particular crime pattern and when people are moving across borders it's important that you be able to disseminate that kind of information uh, readily. Sabraw is already wanted in India. It was here that he received his nickname the Serpent for his uncanny ability to slip out of the grasp of the law. And now the Serpent is on the move again. Following the murders of six young Westerners in Thailand and Nepal, Charles Sabraw, the suspected killer known as the Serpent, is now on the run throughout Asia. Interpol has issued a red notice on the fugitive, placing him on the organization's most wanted list. And the manhunt is on. Although he is already wanted in India, Sabraw enters the country and in no time he has apparently struck again. 
In New Delhi, a young Westerner is found murdered in a tourist hotel. The man's passport and money are missing. The coroner determines that he was poisoned. Three days later, in New Delhi, police respond to a mass poisoning of over 50 tourists at a local hotel. A group of French students claim that their tour guide poisoned them. Police immediately recognize Sabraw. The serpent is taken into custody. Reporter Alan Dawson is not surprised by his arrest. I think Charles really thought that he could do anything he wanted to do, and he wanted to show his power over these people by poisoning them. And Charles went down that day. Sabraw and Marie Leclerc are arrested and charged with poisoning the students. Their accomplice, A.J. Chowdhury, was not with them and has never been seen again. Sabraw is found guilty and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Leclerc, 2-8. They are incarcerated in Tihar prison. But Sabraw manages to get special privileges and uses the media to toy with the authorities back in Thailand. Reporter Alan Dawson visits him several times. I asked him about the murders. He says he is familiar with the victims. He knows what happened to that person. And he makes it very obvious that he was in, directly involved in what happened to that person. And on one visit, disturbing revelation. He proceeded to draw me a map of a place in Pattaya with X marks the spot where a body was buried. And when I came back to Thailand and I gave that map to the police and they went to that spot and dug where it said X and they dug up a body. Thai authorities really did want Charles to come back here, face a court, be found guilty and be shot. Extradition proceedings have already begun as Thai authorities try to bring Sabraw back. They have until 1995 to try the serpent for multiple counts of murder before the statute of limitations runs out. Chief of Interpol in Thailand, Sompol Suthamai. I went to India to check how much progress had been made on our extradition request. At the same time, the Indian police took me to see Charles Sabraj in prison. He well knew that if he came to Thailand, he had to die. He had to be executed, as we had evidence. Charles told me that he feared one thing legally, and that was to be sent to Thailand. Time passes, and the serpent proves to be a model, even famous inmate. The guards seem to enjoy Sabraw's celebrity status and frequently allow him to have guests. On his 10th anniversary in prison, a former inmate returns to visit his good friend. He brings candy with him. Charles generously offers it to everyone. Within the hour, prisoners and guards pass out. The serpent slips out of jail. A fugitive once again. Interpol reopens its file and notifies its members that Sabraw is on the loose. Not sure if Sabraw has left the country or is hiding out locally, New Delhi police assign a surveillance team to stake out the serpent's old haunts. Three weeks later, New Delhi detective Madhukar Zender spots a man wearing a sun hat. I thought, why is this person wearing a sun hat at night? Then, I focused on him. I realized that he looked like Sobraj. My heart started pounding. 
it seems too easy. How can a man, famous for eluding the law, be so careless? Charles Sabraw, a man wanted in Thailand and Nepal for murder, has spent 10 years in an Indian prison. With two years remaining on his sentence, he poisons his guards and escapes. A new Delhi surveillance team is assigned to the case. And in three weeks' time, Detective Madhika Zender tracks him down. Now, it is time to arrest the serpent yet again. The agents make their move. The serpent receives an additional 10 years for the escape. Exactly what he wants. Reporter Alan Dawson. Charles said later the reason he staged his escape was specifically because the time was running out on his real sentence in India that he faced possibly being freed from Indian jail. Uh, he, Thailand had filed extra, his extradition, but that if he escaped from jail in India, that he would not be extradited to Thailand. And that's exactly what happens. India will not extradite a criminal still serving a sentence. While Sabra does the additional jail time in India, the statute of limitation runs out on his crimes in Thailand. In 1997, Charles Sabra is free. Interpol chief Sompol Suthamai. I was angry, angry because I wanted him to be tried, to receive punishment in Thailand, as he killed a large number of people in Thailand. His old accomplice is gone. Marie Leclerc died of cancer in 1984. But Charles Sabraw is never tried for the murders of the two people who were found burnt to death outside of Kathmandu. There is no statute of limitations on murder in Nepal. A warrant for Sabraw's arrest remains in effect. Ganesh KC, a young boy who witnessed the burnt bodies 28 years ago, is now a member of the Kathmandu Police Department. He has never forgotten the sight. It was the first time I saw a dead body. It was as a foreigner, naked, burned. I was really very afraid, very terrified. After his release, the serpent moves to France. He basks in his notoriety and profits off of it, enraging those who want justice, like Hermann Nippenberg. The press reported that there would be sessions in cafes in Paris in which the participants at the table would put up 5,000 US dollars per person for the privilege of sitting with this cold-blooded murderer was, of course, uh, at times uh, difficult for us to swallow. Then, in an odd twist of fate, six years later in October 2003, the serpent returns to Nepal. A journalist snaps a few photos and sells them to the local newspaper. We couldn't believe that the man could be here. We called the paper, they said, we are certain it's him. Two days later, police arrest Charles Sabra as he enters a casino in Kathmandu. I was delighted because I thought that this might give another opportunity to find justice for the two Dutch victims. Nepalese investigator Bishwa Lal Shrestha hopes his patience will be rewarded. We people of law, we believe that justice is delayed, but should never be denied. Justice shouldn't die. 
but arresting a suspect is only part of the battle. The serpent is behind bars again, but justice might still prove elusive. Ganesh KC and the police have a difficult task. Reconstructing a case that was almost 30 years old. He turns to Interpol. It was important for me to get as much evidence as possible. The international community in Interpol offices in different countries helped us to solve this case. Despite Interpol's efforts to help the Nepalese police reconstruct the case against Sabra, there is information that is missing. Interpol's former NCB director in the United States, John Imhoff, knows how hard it is to prosecute cases that are decades old. Interpol has a central repository of records. When you have a pending investigation, you're not going to destroy any records associated with that. So suffice it to say, as long as these cases are outstanding, whatever information comes to Interpol will be collected and stored. The dossier gives Ganesh the evidence he needs to secure a murder charge against Charles Sobra. Sobra has to pay for his crimes and be punished by law. This will allow the souls of his victims to rest in peace. The serpent is currently awaiting trial in a Nepalese jail.